today we're joined by really great speakers and innovators. And I'm here because I'm a storyteller. I carry entire libraries under my skin, and these stories that I carry are meant to be shared. The telling of stories is as old as mankind, and it's always served as a way to bridge gaps and bind ties. But I have found in my experience that being a storyteller can be difficult. It means letting the world in to the darkest things you've seen, the most difficult things you've done, but from somehow finding a way to turn that into something positive, into something people feel hopeful after hearing and not empty and alone. And I hope I achieve that today. My standing here before you can be summed up in one statement, four words to live by. Love is the answer. It is the simple truth and it really is all you need to know. But before you write me off as a naive kid, an idealistic collegiate who doesn't know the hardship of the real world, hear me out, because I've only learned this after traveling to what was once hell on earth and coming out alive on the other side. I've seen what we're capable of. <clears throat> I've only learned this important lesson after seeing the world's darkest secrets. I've looked into the eyes of men who wanted the death of their countrymen with a fire they couldn't quench with anything but spilt blood. I've broken bread. <laughs> Sorry. I've broken bread with the victims of violence we can't begin to imagine. And I'm here to tell my story. So in 2010, I was 20 years old. Um, I was in a class about Africa that just inundated me daily with this fascinating history of the dark continent. And I was restless, and I was adventurous, and so I signed up for study abroad. Um, but mine was a little bit different from the norm. Um, I went to East Africa, and I went there to study post-conflict societies. I spent four months in Uganda and Rwanda, studying Africa's longest civil war in northern Uganda and the most atrocious genocide of recent memory in Rwanda. It broke my heart and left me numb it inspired me daily, and I ran the full gamut of emotional highs and lows every second. My entire world was turned upside down and changed, and I'll never be the same, but I don't want to be, because Rwanda taught me so many things, but most importantly, it taught me how to feel. I've spent a lot of time telling my story since then, but it's difficult, because all I want is to tell people about war and genocide and reconciliation and the human capability to heal, but people ask, did you see elephants? And did you roam the savanna with giraffes? Or did you slaughter chickens? Which I did, and those are so fun to share. Um, my pain over a fat little guy is apparent. But, um, but those aren't the important things. That isn't what defined my experience. It isn't what keeps me up at night still longing for this rust red soil that you know, it would cake my skin so completely I couldn't tell if it was a tan or not. Um, so I jumped on chances like this to share the real stories, the ones that changed me and the ones we can all learn from. The stories we've heard about Rwanda are unfortunately replete with the gruesome details of bloodletting and slaughter. We focus on the darkness. We talk about the planning and the implementation and the failure of the international community but we fail to recognize that there are stories of triumph and hope in these dark places. Today I'm here to tell you that the most important stories of Rwanda have gone untold since 1994. They are stories of hope. They are the ones that we need to hear. I'm guilty of focusing on the darkness myself, though. Um, in, the years since, in the years since coming home, it's so easy to jump to the stories of pain and loss and the ones with shock value that make people say, like, I can't believe you went there. I can't believe you, you went through that. Um, but it doesn't do the Rwandis people justice to focus solely on their tragedy and not their triumph. And it doesn't do our own humanity justice. So I'd like to tell you my favorite story from Rwanda, and it is one of light. And I wish, we heard, I wish we heard more of these from all the dark corners of the globe and all the, the mysterious spaces we're too scared to go and discover for ourselves. So we've been in Rwanda for a few weeks and we thought that our hearts couldn't be broken any more than they already had. We had learned the last words of child victims in Kigali. 
We had seen a picturesque statue of the Virgin Mary overlooking the bloodstained clothing of 20,000 victims in the Amada. We'd gone underground into dark, damp mass graves, touching femurs and machete-cracked skulls with our floundering elbows and trembling knees. We'd learned the smell of human decomposition at Morawi. And we looked into the eyes of this genocidaire at the Tiche. We bore witness to all the horrors the world had stayed silent on. And we were a broken bunch. We were haunted by the ghosts of Rwanda. And if I'm being honest, we still are. But finally, at long last, we found our hope. We found humanity in the hills. We were told we were visiting a women's association in the region of Batare, and I, for one, just hopped in the van and didn't really think much of it because what do I know about goat raising and cassava farming and co-ops? Um, but what we found at Ubutuali Bo Kubaho, which in the Kinyarwanda language means heroism is living, was nothing short of magic. This cooperative of 1,700 women embody the ideals of reconciliation and hope in Rwanda. They brought light to our hearts again. In the years immediately following the genocide, the situation in Rwanda was tumultuous at best. Hutu and Tutsi, perpetrator and victim, collaborator and survivor, were all thrust into this new post-conflict society, living side by side. As was the case throughout Rwanda, survivors <coughs> lived right next door to the families of the people who had perpetrated this violence against them. In Butare, the survivors threw stones as the women, as the wives of the perpetrators walked past their homes. In the words of one genocidaire's wife, we were so filled with fear and shame that we could not look them in the eye. We wanted to ask them for forgiveness for what our husbands had done to their families, or even for some of us who encouraged our husbands to kill. The tire remained divided, and the hate continued, and this hate was exactly the cause of the great pain that they had suffered in the first place. And it was spreading and growing day by day. And then a Christian minister moved into the Tare. Now, the Catholic Church played a large role in the genocide. You had priests abandoning their parishioners to their fate, and it left many Rwandans distrustful. But the situation in Butare was growing dire, and something needed to be done. The wives of the genocidaires began working with the church, asking for help in reconciling with the victims. So the minister began working with both groups individually and moving towards more and more integration. They worked on communication, and they worked on peace building, and they worked on truth telling. They worked on forgiveness, and it took years. But today, 18 years after the genocide that left a million dead in Rwanda, the women of Ubutuali Bokubaho, victims and wives of perpetrators alike, live and work together. They raise goats, they farm, they conduct microfinance projects, they care for each other when they're sick, and they rely on each other in times of financial hardship. But most importantly, they raise their children together, without ethnic distinctions, to be the greatest advocators of peace I've ever encountered. These children have been brought up knowing their fearsome histories, and they strive not to repeat them. They are Bandaranda, not Hutu or Tutsi. <laughs> they are heroes and more passionate about peace than anyone I've ever encountered. It has been said that the children almost broken by the world become the, become the adults most likely to change it. And if these kids aren't the poster children for that, I'm not sure who is. So we sat down with these women and they told us our, their stories. They told us their pain and their struggles, their hopes and their dreams, especially for their children. One woman told us that well, she was ill for two weeks and she didn't go one second without, she didn't go one second alone because the women would take turns coming and sitting by her bedside. And she told us that she knows she won't ever be alone again because these women have become her family. And although their story may seem mostly positive, it wasn't without backlash because many of the women um, in the Tige where the inmates are kept, the genocidaires, um, they can, their families can come and visit them. And these men found out about this new association and they were really angry that their wives had betrayed them and reconciled with the women who had accused them of the genocide that they committed. And so there was a lot of domestic violence, but these women stayed strong, and they, they defied their husbands in a patriarchal society because they knew that reconciliation was the most important thing 
in this, um, in this new world that they were living in. And their husbands eventually did see how essential this association was. Um, so we sat down with these women and we asked them if there was any message that they wanted us to bring back to the West with us. And they said this, tell them our story, but then tell them to love. Take back love. Live your lives for love. Listen to one another, understand one another. Do this and love will come. Love, and this will never happen again. Love and everything is possible. Rwanda embodies the two extremes of our humanity. At one end, you have a hate-fueled thirst for blood, and at the other, the opening of a fist into an outstretched hand. Rwanda's legacy is hate, and it is fear, and it is blood. But it's also a society that has since chosen reconciliation and peace. And I'm not sure that we can really always say the same for our developed world. We, for certain, have not come so far as many Rwandis have come. We haven't come so far as the women of Udutwale Bokubaho have come, staring our fearsome past in the face and deciding that peace is more important than power. We, and I'm speaking for the entire human race here, have the potential for darkness inside each of us. We have inside us a brutality we cannot begin to imagine. But what we are so quick to forget is that we are also capable of unimaginable love and compassion. And I think we would all do well to remember that from time to time. We have within us the same spectrum of extremes as Rwanda, but the choice of which to embody is ours alone. The women of Ubuchwale and Bokuba who have learned and embraced that, and I wonder why sometimes we, we just can't. We're so, we're so quick to assume the worst in people, but, but fear assuming the best, that intentions are good, and that people really are just looking for love. So maybe I'm young and maybe I'm idealistic, but it shouldn't take a genocide to learn that love is the answer. And we shouldn't have to lose everything to realize that love really can conquer all. This life that we all share is not about race or ethnicity or religion, but the one thing that we all have in common in a world that is so obviously hell-bent on tearing us apart and pointing out all the differences. And it's, the, it's so simple. We all just want to be loved. All I can conceivably say on the subject is that wherever you're from, and whatever faith gets you through the hard times, and whatever past defines you, you must all remember that at the end of the day, the answer is love. It is the moral of the story, the whispered last words, the grand finale, and the epilogue. So I'm a storyteller, and these stories that I carry with me, they're not really mine. Um, they're all of ours. Um, they belong to every single one of us, and it's all part of the narrative of our evolving humanity. And so I hope that this story today, their story, what is really our story, will stay with you. Because if there's one thing that we can all do, it's share these stories of hope, and hope that they touch someone. So these stories we hear, they're not that thing that happened in that place to those people far away somewhere, in the place we can't really imagine. And when we find a way to stand together in solidarity and embrace one another, um, to focus more on what unites us rather than what divides us, and feel each story of pain and hope as if it were our own, that's when we'll stand together and reclaim the world, and that's when we'll know peace. When we finally realize that, yes, that thing that's happening in that place, those people in that, in that weird part of the world we can't quite picture in our minds, that it matters and it affects us and we feel it. We feel it deep as if it were our own story. Only then will we affect change in our world. And at long last, the world will be ours again, together. Bryn Muir, my dear friend and fellow traveler, one who has bled her hope for humanity alongside me and traveled to these dark places, has said it best, and I pose her poignant question to you today. Now it is upon us to decide. As we live, we decide which story we let win, and in so doing, we decide who we are. We must let the truths of both death through hatred and life through love be known and remembered but only one may triumph at the end of the day. And so I leave you with one question, and it is this, which truth will we choose to live by?